Hello and welcome back to the channel Airbus What's It Doing Now and to another edition of Safety Corner. Um, in this uh, edition we're going to take a look at engine thrust management and particularly engine thrust management uh, on uh, or engine thrust setting on takeoff. Uh, we'll take a look at a particular event which affected an A320 on takeoff. Um, this is from uh, Flight Safety, Airbus Flight Safety magazine which you can uh, pick up uh, online if you look under flight operations uh, you'll be able to find uh, this uh, takeoff uh, thrust management uh, article i'll put up some illustrations uh, just to add some context uh, to what we're saying here as well but as i say you can read through this at uh, at your own time so what i'm going to do here is a uh, an overview of the event uh, then we'll take a look at not just what happened why it happened and then ultimately how we can uh, mitigate it uh, happening, happening to us and what tools that we have to help us do that. As I say, the event concerned an A320 it was a runway excursion on takeoff due to an asymmetric thrust condition, uh, which led to a loss of uh, directional control. It stresses the importance of the sort of if you like two stage a thrust application from idle up to the stabilization of 50 percent um, there will be some differences between cfm and ie uh, iae engines and this article uh, for this particular aircraft uh, that was affected had IAE engines. So the references are to EPR, but the takeaways are exactly the same. But it's just the importance of that stabilization stage. So I put some uh, meat on the bone and some context to that with some illustrations later on. So the importance of why we have the procedure and um, why the engines may accelerate at uh, different rates or at different speeds and the importance of the thrust set call. Um, why we apply forward stick up until 80 knots and then gently relax up to uh, towards 100 knots uh, and the importance of the correct seating position uh, for the application of uh, rudder and braking in the event of uh, an RTO. Okay, so let's take a look at the uh, particular event then. Uh, and like I say, what happened, why it happened, and how we can mitigate the threats and what tools we have to help us. So this was a 320 IA. E and uh, some illustrations will be coming up and when I talk about EPRs don't worry about it if you are an A320 IAE operator this will all make much more sense to you it doesn't to me because I'm a, um, a CFM chap uh, but it doesn't really matter uh, it, the, 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 the take home point like I say is exactly the same so um, let's have a look at the timeline then the takeoff uh, was with was noted with some asymmetry in the thrust lever position uh, prior to the takeoff uh, commenced and in this case engine number one was showing 1.01 epr and number two epr was 1.03 so there was already some asymmetry there before the uh, application of takeoff thr takeoff thrust so the thrust lead was then advanced to what it says here close to the climb detent obviously for the acceleration engine two accelerated much more rapidly uh, and then the brakes were released so you can see here engine number two had already started from a slightly higher thrust setting and so when the thrust lead was applied and the and the brakes were released because it had already had a bit of a head start engine number two accelerated uh, much more rapidly so 1.03 to 1. Point, uh, to 1.24 uh, as toga um, no so not as toga as takeoff thrust uh, was selected and the thrust levers moved forward of uh, the flex uh, gate so it might suggest that perhaps this might have been a toga takeoff but it's not uh, actually um, detailed in this article but the point to take away here was that the significant uh, asymmetry as they move towards takeoff thrust so due to engine number two accelerating um, more rapidly the aircraft starts to veer then to the left 
To compensate this, the uh, pilot flying applied right rudder and then uh, closed both thrust levers. The assumption here perhaps then was to um, carry out the rejected takeoff procedure. Um, as the aircraft then veers then to the right as a subsequent to these actions, um, asymmetric thrust is then applied with then left rudder and at the same time left tiller input. This then causes significant veering off uh, to the left hand side. At this point then uh, counteractive input was applied with full right rudder and asymmetric braking and full reverse thrust. The aircraft then veers off to the right and then comes to rest some 300 uh, meters from the runway threshold and off to the left hand side uh, of the runway. The interesting thing with this uh, that's to note is that the aircraft speed remained below 31 knots throughout uh, the event. So really, really relatively low speed and clearly well below VMCG, which um, is the minimum control speed uh, on the ground, which obviously con contributed towards the uh, difficulties in controlling the aircraft uh, on the ground or the ability to control it on the ground. I guess, you know, um, uh, it, that's the that's the definition of controllability on the ground, isn't it? Um, so you can see there that uh, um, low speed and high asymmetry or high asymmetric power has uh, some significant effects uh, on handling of the aircraft. Um, so why and getting back to uh, root cause then? Well, as is detailed in the article here, rapid asymmetric thrust uh, increase at low speed leading to uh, control uh, difficulties. Some of the secondary contributions maybe from tiller inputs, um, which if you read the FCTM is not recommended due to an overreaction. Uh, it's, it's not recommended, but I guess in this event, it's, it's one of the inputs that the pilot felt was uh, necessary in order to regain control of the aircraft. But you can see there just how powerful the nose wheel steering can be in, in controlling the aircraft, even at relatively low speeds. But primarily... The root cause of this incident was due to large asymmetry of thrust at low speed, um, and of course no pardon me, no stabilization of the thrust before takeoff thrust uh, was set, and the asymmetry uh, wasn't really detected until it was too late. So why can this, or how does this asymmetry? manifest itself how can it happen why why would we ever really see that on whether it be a cfm or iae engines aren't they the same aren't they built the same don't they don't the isn't the engineering in, in such a way that they should accelerate at the same time well apparently not um there's a couple of things which are going on here some of it's actually by design um so as you can see here in figure two, uh, which, uh, which I'll bring up as an illustration here, that the acceleration on any engine is by design, uh, not linear. Um, this is all to do with the built-in engine control laws, which will optimize the acceleration of the engine um, whilst reducing the risk of an engine stall. Uh, you can see that the thrust over time is relatively flat uh, during the initial acceleration. Then, of course, accelerates more linearly as uh, as the time uh, increases beyond what would be, which we'll come on to later on, at uh, at fifty percent. Also, the engine performance changes with age, and I guess as we all get a little bit older, we all become a little bit less effective and efficient. Um, so, yeah, it, they, they wear over time. The engineering processes and tolerances also mean that ultimately two engines are never going to be absolutely the same. Uh, and there may be some differences in performance for, for acceleration. Um, another interesting point is that idle thrust may also differ, uh, which alters the acceleration profile as, um, as seen by the two graphs here. So in figure three, we can see the uh, differing acceleration profiles between two um, comparable engines um, and the idle at the uh, same point. In figure four, 
this is slightly different. So this is um, where the idle is slightly differing between the two. So figure three shows us two similar engines with a similar um, idling point and a slightly different profile there for the acceleration. So no two engines are going to be the same. Figure four shows a slightly higher idle. It gives an earlier acceleration profile. And then figure five shows uh, what happens when you don't give the engines the opportunity to stabilize and again can produce very different accelerating prof uh, acceleration profiles um, um, giving a, a, a quite a strong asymmetric uh, thrust condition um, again difficult to counteract and again a likely uh, cause in this particular case so that's what's happened why it may have happened uh, and also looking at the makeup of the engines and and just I think it's really important for us to realize that no two engines are the same the importance of having a, a base setting for idle thrust for the two engines and the importance of that stabilization process uh, in actually getting the engines to a point where they're both the same before we then set our takeoff thrust so let's have a look at how and so how do we mitigate this um, this um, event uh, from, from from a reoccurrence so we have our company standard operating procedures here which uh, help mitigate this uh, threat for us and we can see here in figure six the, uh, the whole process uh, uh, working for us it shows you the 50 percent n1 this is to stabilize the engines as we've mentioned before the importance of monitoring the thrust uh, n1 egt um, throughout the takeoff roll and also the importance of the thrust set call to ensure that whether it's flex or it's toga thrust is actually achieved. Those datums are achieved by 80 knots, giving us the, object, the option to reject the takeoff. And there's a nice uh, picture here in uh, figure six, which kind of goes through that in a timeline quite nicely. Having a look at uh, figure seven now shows us the... Um, the effects of the stabilization beyond 50 percent n1 the increase in thrust beyond 50 percent will be almost identical you can see here the margin below 50 percent uh, where the greatest asymmetry uh, can can be identified this indicates that um, from idle up to 50% is where we're more likely to see, uh, or, or whatever EPR setting that might be for you in stabilization with your company and your engines. But you can see here that the greatest asymmetry is going to be uh, sub 50%. Once we've got the 50%, and you see that there on that timeline, any advancement from that will be a symmetrical thrust increase after the stabilization step. So you can see there, uh, on that figure pictorially why that uh, why that is so important and it, the importance is to get that linear thrust uh, before we start advance to the higher thrust settings to prevent that uh, asymmetry good okay so hopefully that adds uh, a little bit uh, of context as to why that step is uh, super important and um, it's a contributing factor to this incident that missing that step um, uh, caused the greater asymmetry, which of course uh, the the divergence off the run, runway center line. Um, a couple of other bits and pieces here as well concerning 180 degree turns on the runway and to be very careful with this one because part of that uh, procedure involves asymmetric thrust um, when turning the aircraft through 180 degrees to assist with that turning and to make sure that both thrust levers are brought back to idle again uh, before you then commence uh, your takeoff roll for, for obvious reasons. Um, forward stick well why do we do that uh, we know that that's to counter any nose up tendency but of course preventing that nose up tendency uh, increases the load on the nose wheel and that will assist us in directional control uh, on the ground uh, one of the other safety items which was highlighted in this report was the seating position and uh, pedal uh, adjustment uh, rudder pedal and if uh, and the necessity to uh, allow full 
uh, deflection of the rudder pedals and uh, braking. So I think when we come back to work now, it's been a while since we've been in the aircraft. It, it's probably a good idea just to take a little bit of time to get that seating position right. And perhaps before we sort of move off, maybe if we did our flight controls whilst we were at a standstill, not only to make sure you've got full rudder deflection, but you can also slide your foot up the rudder pedals and apply maximum differential braking. Um, going back to when we first learned how to fly the aircraft, ensuring that we've got a slight bend in our knee um, uh, at the, whilst we're at full extension with our leg, just to ensure that we've got that full control in the event of uh, an event of an RTO. Um, there is a little bit of detail in this article about the crosswind or tailwind takeoff procedure, um, which is uh, worth uh, reviewing uh, here. Um, I I'm not going to go into the full uh, crosswind tailwind takeoff procedure. Um, that, that I might just do that for in, in another video. But uh, whilst I talk about it here, it it's, it's uh, probably just a good idea to review why why we have this procedure and there's three illustrations here to help us uh, help us with it the first one shows us the normal flow of air into the engine this is what we're like this is what we're trying to achieve a nice linear airflow into the uh, front of the engine um, in either the tailwind or the crosswind takeoff uh, procedure or whether you have a tailwind or any tailwind or a crosswind in excess of 20 knots this can cause a distortion of the airflow and potential stalling of the engine so the first step is exactly the same whether we're doing a normal takeoff or a crosswind tailwind takeoff and that's the stabilization so we carry that out regardless of what type of takeoff we're doing here the second stage which is the 70 percent uh, and then uh, ensuring we've got a 15 knot ground speed before we then go up towards our flex or our toga that is to ensure that we've got some forward momentum some ram air if you like to come into the front of the engine to counter um, this uh, disturbed airflow okay so in summary then uh, i'm just going to read out this uh, short paragraph here uh, from the article itself so to ensure that the aircraft's engines simultaneously accelerate during the early stages of the takeoff roll the flight crews must wait for all engines to reach the stabilization step before advancing the thrust levers to command the takeoff thrust i think that's been well documented here isn't it and those um, um pictures there which uh, which we highlighted the importance of that and and, and just why just some of the reasoning behind it uh, if the pilot flying applies takeoff thrust directly from idle without observing the stabilization step the engines may accelerate at different rates and this will cause an asymmetric thrust condition which may be difficult to counteract and could lead to a lateral runway excursion event as was uh, the case here in the case of a tailwind or significant crosswind, the progressive increase of engine thrust from stabilization set up to take off thrust will allow the gradual acceleration of the aircraft to counter the effects of the distorted airflow at the engine's inlet and avoid the airflow disturbances inside the engine that may cause the engine to stall. So that just goes back to what we were saying earlier on about the takeoff technique changing slightly with crosswind or tailwind, but they both start from the stabilization stage. It's just that we want to see some forward momentum and some ram air, dynamic air coming into the engine before we advance towards our takeoff setting to prevent the stall. Um, if an asymmetrical thrust condition is experienced at low speed during the takeoff roll, the flight crew cannot counteract it just through rudder pedals alone. The takeoff must be rejected using all of uh, thrust uh, reversers and by applying differential braking if needing to bring the aircraft to a safe stop. So that goes back again to the importance of your seating position. Um, I think that was a, a really good event to review. Uh, I think it just reminds us of the importance of the SOP and um, that the, the some of the uh, tech, uh, context behind why we set 50%, um, context uh, behind the importance of monitoring the N1s and EGT and thrust setting uh, during the takeoff and how important it is to make sure that we're seated correctly in the event of an RTO. Thanks again for uh, tuning in. I hope you found the 
briefing and this article useful. Um, please like if you felt that it deserves a like. It really helps the channel. Keep safe, keep the plates spinning, and I'll talk to you again very soon.